Unsurprisingly, I'm going to tell you yes. As I say, it's not just a rhetorical question. And there's some people who like to engage on this, perhaps in, in the q and I'd, I'd be very happy to do that. I've thought about this a lot. And I'd love to talk about it. But maybe more fundamentally, and more apropos of what it is that we're here to speak about tonight, the question is, can we do this in the digital age? And it's not a frivolous question. The world has changed tremendously. I was telling some of the students a little bit earlier today what it was like when I was operating under non-official cover. I was operating as a, a business person, unconnected with the US government back in the, the mid-1980s. And I was traveling around the world, meeting with uh, intelligence assets. Various points during 27 years, I had a lot of different covers. I'm not revealing any national secrets when I say that there were times when I was opposing as a diplomat, other times as a civilian member of the Department of the Army. I had other covers as well. But in those years, when I was operating ostensibly as a business person traveling internationally, as I think back on it now, it was unbelievable what we were able to get away with. I had a pocket full of alias documents, another pocket full of cash, and I could go pretty much anywhere I wanted and do pretty much anything I wanted to do. But there was a day, it was in the mid-1980s, and I went to check into a hotel, a large, popular hotel in Geneva. I presented my passport at the desk, and the clerk turned around, took something off of a, a printer, and he placed it on the desk in front of me. Let's just say that I was Mr. Smith that day. And this little form letter said, welcome back, Mr. Smith. We're very glad to have you. Nothing particularly surprising about that, is there? Not in today's context. I had been there before. I'd been there a little over a year before. Now, it's not new that hotels then, or since time immemorial maybe, would have records. And so if the inspector of police in Geneva were to have come to that hotel and said, please, I wish to see a record concerning a Monsieur Schmidt. I need to know if he has stayed in your hotel on the 25th of January in 1988. <laughs> your cooperation would be appreciated. We've seen this movie, right? And, and so the nervous clerk, sweating bullets, he rushes back and he pulls out the paper records and, oh, yes sir, yes sir, there is a Mr. Schmidt and he, he was with us on the 25th of January. He was in room 1219. But when I made the reservation to go and stay in that hotel, I didn't think that they were gonna be going over 30 some years of paper records to find out if I'd ever stayed there before. We forget what life was like, and it wasn't that long ago, believe me. But now, when I saw this form letter that said, welcome back, Mr. Smith, oh my God. It was like the future in a flash had opened up before my eyes, and I didn't like what I was seeing. Think about it. If this man in this hotel can do that, because all this information is suddenly available to him. Well, what if they did that at border crossings? What if they did it at multiple border crossings simultaneously? What if somebody in the immigration department of a particular country that I was traveling through could see the pattern of travel that I had made over a course of years and then correlate it with other things that were happening at the same time? And I wasn't even thinking about machine-readable passports or biometrics. But like a bolt of lightning, suddenly I could see the future. And it did not look good. This was going to be a very bad thing for espionage. I remember also during that time, when I was traveling internationally, particularly if I was traveling through an international gateway where they had fairly serious immigration controls, I would show up at the airport early and I would go 
to a newsstand and I would purchase a newspaper. And I'd go and I'd find a quiet spot and I'd sit and I'd open up the newspaper and act as though I were reading it. But what I was really doing was going over my story in my head. I'd literally sit there and say, okay, who am I? Who do I represent? What company am I with? What business am I doing? Who am I going to meet? Where did I go to college? What did I major in? What year did I graduate? What's my, what's my mother-in-law's maiden name? All those things that I should know automatically if I am who I say I am. But at that time, certainly during the course of an interview, and unless they were so suspicious of me, they were going to arrest me for several days so they could launch a, a full investigation. They weren't going to be able to check on any of this. If I was glib, if I had the answers, if I acted perfectly normal, I was going to get through 99 times out of 100, even in the unlikely event that they pulled me into a, a secondary interrogation. Think about the situation now. Some little guy sitting in the back room in a matter of minutes would be able to come back out and say, wait a minute, you know, Bowdoin College, 1976, there was no Smith. Think how many other holes he could have poked in my story, even when I was telling as much of the truth, of the truth as I possibly could. Think about the fact that I didn't have any credit history. And that name, oh, this is very interesting, Mr. Smith. You have a credit card. According to this credit card, you've never engaged in a, in a single non-cash transaction before six months ago. How old are you? <laughs> you couldn't do it. And what it means is that, by and large, by and large, there are always exceptions, but by and large, nowadays anymore, you have to be who you say you are. What's an honest spy to do? <laughs> this is terrible. And it makes life much, much more difficult. That is espionage in the digital age. What that means, therefore, is that the paradigm has had to change. And this has been underway for a long time now, and it's a, it's a progression that was still very much underway when I left six years ago. And I have no doubt, although they don't tell me anything anymore, I have no doubt that it's still underway now. And it's a difficult thing. If you have to be who you say you are, and you can't do the sorts of things that I did with impunity back in the mid-1980s. That means if we want somebody to be able to pose as a nuclear scientist, she better be a nuclear scientist. You know, back in the good old days of the Cold War, when we were primarily focused on the Russians and the Chinese, the communist powers, these were closed societies. The very few people who were actually able to come out of these societies, and the few people who were able to come out of those societies disproportionately were, were diplomats and others assigned to embassies abroad. And so people like me typically were posing as diplomats. That was pretty easy. I spent a lot of my career as a State Department officer. And you go to cocktail parties and you try to bump into these people and you try to develop a personal relationship that you hoped would turn into an intelligence relationship. But when you're dealing with terrorism and nuclear proliferation, proliferation of missiles, narcotics. You have to be able to go places. You have to be able to be things that are very, very difficult to establish and to maintain, particularly, particularly if you have to be who you say you are. Think of the effort that would be required to do that. Think on, at the same time, of all the things that we want a staff operations officer. Now, mind you, let's get the nomenclature right here. We don't talk about CIA agents. Agents are the individuals, usually foreign nationals, who have access to, of information, uh, access to information of interest to the US government 
And they're the ones who provide that information. They are the sources. We call them agents. Officers, people 